Chapter Twenty One of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One, Lord Rosebery. In the early days of the fiscal controversy, I was dining with two politicians at the table of a mutual friend in the temple. The politicians, one a peer and the other a commoner, had been and still were liberal imperialists. Both are now in the government. The talk turned, as it always did in those days, on the prospect of a C.B. or a Rosebery cabinet. I must admit, said the commoner, that C.B. has treated me very handsomely. I attacked him bitterly in the midst of the war. Most men would have remembered it. He has forgotten it, and when last week he was asked to preside at a meeting I was to address, he consented cheerfully, without a moment's hesitation. Now Rosebery is a man whom you never know how you will catch. He may be all smiles today, and tomorrow you will find him cold and remote as an iceberg. Yes, said the peer, he came down to the house this afternoon to support my motion and delivered an excellent speech. I met him in the lobby afterwards, stopped him, and thanked him for his support. He turned on his heel without a word and walked away. He turned on his heel and walked away. The phrase sums up Lord Rosebery. He is always turning on his heel and walking away, now from his friends, now from himself. He is as inconstant as the moon, unstable as water, whimsical as a butterfly. His path leads from nowhere to nowhere. He is like a man lost in the mist on the mountains and having no compass with which to guide his steps. He has all the gifts except the gift of being able to apply them. Macaulay said of Byron that all the good fairies brought their offerings at his christening, but the one malignant fairy, uninvited, came and turned the gifts of the others to bitterness. And so with Lord Rosebery. He was endowed with all the elements of greatness, but the elements are not enough. They must be compounded into unity by that indefinable something, constant and purposeful, which we call character, and it is the quality of character which Lord Rosebery lacks, and lacking that he lacks all. His gifts are idle ornaments, his life a drama without a sequence and without a theme. He is the tragedy of unfulfillment. Twenty-five years ago he rode in the lists the most brilliant figure in the land. The son of Gladstone was near the setting, but here was the promise of the dawn of another day hardly less splendid. Genius and wealth, wit and wisdom, fascination and the gift of incomparable speech all combined and all fused by a young and chivalrous enthusiasm that drew all men's hearts to him. He rode by the side of his great chief in those memorable Midlothian days, a figure of romance carrying the golden key of the golden future. With what enthusiasm we saw him enter the brief ministry of 1886 as foreign minister. With what high hopes we welcomed his splendid championship of the new London County Council. Saw him fling himself into the great cause of a regenerated London, saw him sitting seven hours a day in the chair, taking his chocolate in place of a meal. Here was indeed the man to lead us into the promised land. Was it all fault, that world of knightly deeds, the splendid quest, the good fight ringing clear? Yonder the dragon ramps with fiery gorge, yonder the victim faints and gasps and bleeds. But in his merry England, our St. George sleeps a base sleep beside his idle spear. What is the meaning of it all? For answer, one recalls that saying of William Johnson, his tutor in his Eton days, Dalmany has the finest combination of qualities I have ever seen. He will be an orator, and if not a poet, such a man as poets delight in. But he is one of those who like the palm without the dust the palm without the dust. But it is the dust which gives the palm its meaning. It is the race and not the reward that matters. Fortune, with cruel irony, gave him the palm without the pursuit. He found it an emblem of nothing, and he threw it scornfully aside. He had not paid for it in toil and devotion, and he could not value that for which he had not paid. He has been the spoiled child of fortune, the type of the futility of riches, whether of mind or of circumstance, undisciplined in the hard school of struggle. It was as though he had the Midas touch. 
all things turned to gold beneath his hand. He had but to express a wish, and it was fulfilled. He had but to appear, and the path was clear before him. That triple ambition which is attributed to him is true in spirit, if not in fact. He would marry the richest heiress in England. He would win the Derby. He would become Prime Minister. He would have the palm, but not the dust. He would have learning, but he would go down rather than sacrifice his racing stud at Oxford. He would have the premiership, but he would not sit on a stool in the home office. He would command, but he would not serve. It is said of Sir James Picton, that brilliant hero of Waterloo, that he would never have learned to command because he had never learned to obey. Lord Rosebery never learned to obey. He served no apprenticeship to life, and the inconstancy of the brilliant amateur is over all he does. Above all, he served no apprenticeship to politics. Fortune, cruel in its kindness here, as always, sent him straight to the House of Lords. Again, the palm without the dust. What a mind! What endowments the man has! said Mr. Churchill, speaking of him to me. I feel that if I had his brain I would move mountains. Oh, that he had been in the House of Commons! There is the tragedy, never to have come into contact with realities, never to have felt the pulse of things. That is what is wrong with Rosebery. There is truth in this, but it is not all the truth. He has, it is true, the petulance and impatience of the unschooled mind, but his real defect as a politician goes deeper than circumstance. It is in his nature. He has the temperament of the artist, not of the politician. The artist lives by the intensity of his emotions and his impressions. The world of things is colored and transmuted in the realm of his mind. He is subjective, personal, a harp responsive to every breeze that blows. The breath of the May morning touches him to ecstasy. The east wind chills him to the bone. He passes quickly through the whole gamut of emotion, tasting a joy unknown to coarser minds, plunging to depths unplumbed by coarser minds. He is a creature of moods and moments, and spiritually he often dies young. The successful politician is made of sterner and harder stuff. His view is objective, and the less introspection he has, the better, for introspection palsies action. He applies his mind to things, like a mechanic. They are the material that he molds to his slow purposes. He is not governed by them, but governs them. He is insensitive to impressions, and if he has emotions and impulses, has learned, like Gladstone, to be their master and not their slave, to use them and not to be used by them. He is, in fact, a man of business, cold and calculating even in his enthusiasms, not a poet lit with the rose-light of romance. Walpole, Pitt, Chamberlain, Asquith, these are the type of the politician. Lord Rosebery's temperament is that of Byron rather than of these. There is in him, indeed, much of the Byronic instinct for melodrama. He rather enjoys making our flesh creep with horrific vaticinations and proclaiming the end of all things to our affrighted souls. There was a curious illustration of this rhetorical tendency at the dinner of welcome given to the Imperial Press Conference at the White City. His speech was couched in the most foreboding vein. Deeper and deeper grew the silence and the gloom as he pictured the menace that encompassed us and when, in a thrilling whisper, he spoke of the peace that hung over Europe being charged with such a significant silence that we might almost hear a leaf fall, we felt as though the German navy were already off Tilbury docks. And at that moment there was a roar, like the roar of a hundred guns, outside. For an instant we thought that Lord Rosebery had uttered his warning too late, and that our doom was sealed but then the truth flashed on us it was ten o'clock the hour at which the fireworks display began at the exhibition grounds outside it was mr brock and not the german navy who was offering his comment on the speech within it seemed a singularly appropriate comment conceived in the true spirit of this artist in the histrionics of public life it is not difficult to see that to so variable a temperament political leadership was impossible 
the public may enjoy the moods of the artist but in affairs it demands constancy of mind and distrust the man of moods in this it has the true instinct of the child it was a deep truth that was uttered by the rustic who was asked whether wordsworth was not fond of children happen he was he replied but they wasn't very fond of him he was a man of moods thou seest the man of moods has no welcome in the kingdom of the child and no permanent place in the leadership of men it is this incalculable quality that has made lord rosebery the spendthrift of political friendship no man in our time has run through such a fortune in friends as he has done his path is strewn with their wreckage when like achilles he went to his tent they gathered round him with loyal devotion they left the titular chief in chill isolation to fight the battle of liberalism through the bitter years of the war they sacrificed everything to woo him back to the battle line they became imperialist they formed a league in his service they kept the way clear for his return when the war was over c b himself in the historic interview besought him to come back i liked rosebery he told me and took the leadership always hoping to see him back no no c b he said i do not belong to your tabernacle the more he was importuned the more wayward and impenetrable he became he continued to speak but he never spoke without turning his guns on his old friends even when the fiscal issue arose he spoke in unclear tones free trade was not in the sermon on the mount he flung the mantle of mystery around him took refuge more and more within himself his friends hoped against hope the day of decision was near still they waited for him then he went down to bodmin and declared i will not serve under that banner and with that final word he pronounced his political extinction and rehabilitated liberalism he had squandered the last penny of his political fortune he was left a lonely figure in his lonely furrow a political profligate at the end of his resources and yet tout savoir c'est tout pardonner perhaps if we knew all the inner history of that brilliantly futile life the verdict would be given in sorrow and not in anger it is not for me to raise the curtain on the rosebery harcourt feud the two were flint and steel they met only to clash and strike fire lord rosebery would not serve under sir william in the home office it can be imagined with what feelings the great stalwart of liberalism saw the young rebel snatch the palm from his grasp in the moment of victory he took office under him but the wound rankled and sir william could be an ill bedfellow it was a sorry business said one who was in the cabinet to me and my sympathies were with rosebery he was not well treated perhaps there we have the secret of the wasted life or perhaps it is in that domestic sorrow that robbed him of the wife to whom he was deeply attached or in that cruel affliction of insomnia which has pursued him for long years making him a night wanderer in search of sleep one thinks of him taking his carriage under the stars and driving 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 and of the cheerless dawn breaking on the unslept eyes yes perhaps to know all would be to understand all there he sits on the cross benches of the house of lords his head leaning back on his linked hands his heavy-lidded light blue eyes fixed in a curious impassive stare a sphinx whose riddle no man can read a sphinx gazing bleakly at the universal blank of nature's works to him expunged and raised a lonely man full of strange exits and entrances incoherent inexplicable flashing out in passionate melodramatic utterances disappearing into some remote fastness of his solitary self the light has vanished from the morning hills the vision has faded in gray disenchantment he is the flying dutchman of politics a phantom vessel floating about on the wide seas without an anchor and without a port it is significant that his latest work should deal with the last phase of napoleon for it is that solitary figure standing on the rock of st helena and gazing over the sea at the setting sun of whom he most reminds us behind the far-off murmur of the great world where he was once the hero now lost to him forever 
behind the far-off murmur of the great world where he was once the hero now lost to him forever before the waste of lonely waters and the engulfing night end of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two General Booth. When General Booth rises to receive you in his office in Queen Victoria Street, the first impression you have is of the alertness of the lithe, lean form in its frogged coat with the legend Blood and Fire blazing in red letters below the reverend white beard the second impression comes from the eye certain men live in the memory by the quality of the eye alone that was so in the case of gladstone his eye obsessed you it seemed to light on you like a living thing it penetrated you like a sword and enveloped you like a flame it was as though he seized you in his masterful embrace and swept you whither he would you did not question you obeyed no man who ever fell under the compelling hypnotism of that imperial and imperious eye will ever forget it general booth too dwells in the memory by the eye it does not dominate you as gladstone did but it fascinates you by its concentration it searches the thought behind your words it seems with its beady brilliancy to be burrowing in the dark places of your mind you feel that your secret if you have one is being unearthed you are sapped and mined your defences are crumbling beneath that subtle assault there is nothing for it but flight or surrender you emerge from the interview with a new and revised version of the general you went in to meet a saint and a visionary you come out having met the astutest business man in the city you feel that if the tradesman's son of nottingham had applied himself to winning wealth instead of to winning souls he would have been the rockefeller of england he would have engineered corners and squeezes without precedent he would have made the world of finance tremble at his nod when he passes by the stock exchange he must say there but for the grace of god goes william booth his genius for affairs is visible in the vast fabric of his creation the world has seen nothing like this movement that in one brief generation has overspread the earth with a network of social and regenerative agencies you may question its permanence you may doubt its methods but as an achievement the achievement of one man it is a miracle it astonishes by its absolute independence of motive and origin loyola's society of jesus sprang organically out of the roman church wesley to the end regarded his movement as a movement within the church but the salvation army is unique it has no relationship with any church or any system like topsy it growed it is an empire within the empire it is a system without a dogma and without an intellectual interpretation it is in fact a revival movement converted into an organism it is a miracle which could only have been performed by an autocrat and general booth is above everything an autocrat l'état c'est moi his whole career is a record of absolute reliance on the leading of his own spirit this quality revealed itself even as a boy of sixteen when left fatherless with the burden of a business upon him he cut himself adrift from the church of england in which he had been baptized and brought up and took to street preaching he had been fired by the visit to nottingham of the american revivalist james cowie whose straightforward conversational way of putting things and whose common-sense manner of forcing his hearers to a decision seized his imagination he allied himself with wesleyanism gave up business and began his campaign gathering his crowds in the street wet or fine taking them to the penitent form inside reaching the poor and the outcast if in no other way than by songs and shouting wesleyanism was shocked by these improprieties it sought to make him respectable he found himself in his own phrase hooked into the ordinary rut and put on to sermon making and preaching he refused to be respectable he cut wesleyanism and tried congregationalism 
he found it bookish and intellectual and turned to the methodist new connection of which he was ordained a minister fifty years ago but again the fetters of restraint galled him he was put on circuit work instead of the revival work he passionately desired the final emancipation came at the liverpool conference of the connection in eighteen sixty one once more despite his appeals he was allocated to circuit work never said william booth never echoed the voice of his wife from the gallery and so at thirty-two without a penny of assured income and with a wife and four young children to support he faced the world a free man and when his movement began to emerge from mile end waste amid the brickbats of the whitechapel mob and the hideous caricature of the skeleton army the same masterful spirit prevailed he found his ideas hindered by the conference and the conference banished like a duma in a wave of his hand not even his family must break his iron law his son desired to remain in america beyond the term allowed for service insisted on remaining then his son must go do you question the future of the army the future is provided for i the general have named my successor who will it be no one knows but me not even the lawyers know his name is sealed up in an envelope and the lawyers know where to get it when my death is announced the envelope will be opened and the new general proclaimed it is magnificent and it is war there is the key to the mystery it is war it is still the custom in some quarters to ridicule the military aspects of the army it is inconceivable that the insignia and discipline of militarism can have any literal application to the spiritual realm the thing is a travesty we sing onward christian soldiers but that is only a poetic simile and the christian army sits in comfortable pews outside the range of fire general booth conceived a literal warfare his battleground the streets his army uniformed and disciplined challenging the world with fierce war cries its principal unquestioning obedience it is necessary to remember this when we charge him with being a dictator an army in the field must be ruled by a dictator and his is an army in the field they call me a pope sometimes he says i reply it is the only way twenty people are banded together and nineteen are for taking things easily and if you leave them to themselves they will take the easy path but if you say go that's the path they will go my people now want and wait to be commanded his mistake is in supposing that a dictatorship can be bequeathed cromwell made the experiment and the commonwealth vanished a system which derives all its vitality from a personality may fade when that personality is withdrawn for the salvation army is not a church or a philosophy or a creed it is an emotion an emotion you look in that astute eye so keen so matter-of-fact so remote from the visionary gleam and ask for the key of the riddle and the truth dawns on you that there is a philosophy behind the emotion when the artful politician sets out on an adventure he appeals to the emotion of patriotism or to the emotion of hate of the foreigner and fear of the unknown so general booth has a practical purpose behind the spiritual emotion he is in a word a politician he is a social reformer working through the medium of spiritual exaltation wesley saw only the celestial city and he called on men to flee from the city of destruction general booth points to the celestial city and he uses the power generated by the vision to drain the city of destruction and make it habitable he is as designedly political as any socialist for it is the redemption of society in the material as well as the spiritual sense that is his aim but politics in the party meaning are forbidden to his followers as absolutely as alcohol change the laws by all means he says to the politician but i am working to change the heart we are tunneling from opposite sides of the hill perhaps we shall meet in the middle he has the enthusiasm of humanity he loves mankind in the mass after the fashion of the philanthropist the average man is touched by the incidental and particular his pity is casual and fleeting his heart goes out at the moving tale 
he feels for the sorrow he sees but he is cold to misery in the mass and generally shares the conviction of the northern farmer that the poor in a rump is bad the philanthropist on the other hand is often cold to the particular but he has that imaginative sympathy that bleeds for the misery of a world his pity is not casual it is a frame of mind his eyes look out over wasted lands his ears ring with lamentation and an ancient tale of wrong he is not so much indifferent to the ordinary interests of life as unconscious of them general booth's detachment from the world is as complete as if he were an anchorite of the desert he has a single purpose the one prudence in life says emerson is concentration the one evil dissipation general booth has the concentration of the fanatic the fanatic governed by the business mind he carries no impedimenta politics are a closed book to him the quarrels of creeds are unheard literature unknown his knowledge of golf is confined as bajo said of the eton boy's knowledge of greek to a suspicion that there is such a game yet he is the most familiar figure in all the world he has travelled further and spoken to more diverse peoples than any man in any time to hindus by the sacred ganges to japanese by the sacred mountain in germany often in america and australia and new zealand he flashes from land's end to john o'groats in a motor-car whips across to berlin is heard of in south africa yet all the time he seems to be in the bare room in queen victoria street talking eagerly as he walks about and stopping at intervals to take you by the lapel of the coat to emphasize a point all his activity bespeaks the ascetic any amount of work can be performed by careful feeders says meredith it is the stomach that kills the englishman general booth is careful of his stomach he lives the life of a spartan his income has never exceeded that of a curate for it is wholly derived from a fund of five thousand pounds invested for him years ago by an admirer a fund which returns to the benefactor after the general's death from the army he draws nothing beyond travelling expenses his indifference to the judgments of the world has in it a touch of genius it is not easy to be vulgar religion like society suffers from the creeping paralysis of respectability the general set himself to shock the world by vulgarity and he rejoiced in the storm he created he had nothing to do with the world of proprieties and good form his task was to reclaim the abyss where the methods of organized christianity were futile my work is to make war on the hosts that keep the underworld submerged and you cannot have war without noise we'll go on singing and marching with drums beating and cornets playing all the time it is the instinct of the business man the instinct of advertisement applied to unselfish ends he is the showman of religion i would stand on my head at the top of st paul's cross if i thought it would bring men to salvation intellectualism has no place in his life theology he leaves to the schools and the churches and modernism is a word that has no meaning for him metaphysics are not a path to the masses and his answer to the new theology would be alleluia his creed is like holmes's i have a creed said holmes it is summed up in the first two words of the pater noster and when i say them i mean them so with the general the religion of the army is summed up in the two great commandments thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart and thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself he applies no other formula the dogmas will take care of themselves a man tells us he is a catholic we ask are you a good catholic are you true to the principles of your faith and so with the protestant his banner is as broad as the heavens his methods are his own and he will bend them to no man he never argues he simply goes on as if he did not hear i shall not reply to dr dowie i leave my work to speak for me we must both answer to the great judge of all he is charged with sweating with not paying the trade union rate of wages what are trade unions to me or i to trade unions he seems to say i am saving the lost i am setting their foot on the ladder stand aside 
His finances have been constantly challenged, but he will not disclose them. Yet his personal probity has never been impugned, and when, in 1892, the agitation came to a head, and a committee consisting of Sir Henry James, Lord Onslow, Mr. Long, and others was appointed to investigate the facts, it found that no member of his family had ever derived any benefit from the money raised for his darkest England scheme, that the administration had been businesslike, economical, and prudent, and that the accounts had been kept in a proper and clear manner. He is charged with indifference to the source of his money. I was once reproached with having accepted a donation of a hundred pounds from a well-known Marquis. It is tainted money, they said. What if it was? Give us the money, I say. We will wash it clean with the tears of the fatherless and lay it on the altar of humanity. He has the unconquerable cheerfulness of the man who lives for a cause and has no anchorage in things or possessions my wife is in heaven and i have no home merely a place where i keep some furniture he says but no man i ever met is less weary he has the dauntless spirit of youth how old do they say i am seventy-nine what nonsense i am not old i am seventy-nine years young i have heaps of time yet to go around fishing fishing for souls in the same old way with the same old net he is like an idea, an enthusiasm, that lives on independent of the flesh. The flame of the spirit flares higher as the candle gutters to the end. He will go out with a burst of hallelujahs and a roll of drums. End of chapter 22「twenty three of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three Lord Lorburn Lord Lorburn started life with two enormous advantages. He was a Scotsman, and he was known as Bob Reed. To be born a Scotsman is to be born with a silver spoon in the mouth. It is to be born, as it were, into the governing family. We English are the hewers of wood and drawers of water for our Caledonian masters. Formerly they used to raid our borders and steal our cattle, but they kept to their own soil. In those happy days an Englishman had a chance in his own country. Today he is little better than a hog-carrier. The Scotsmen have captured not our cattle, but the British Empire. They sit in the seats of the mighty. Westminster is their washpot, and over Canada do they cast out their shoe. The head of the English church is a Scotsman, and his brother of York came out of a Scotch Presbyterian manse. The premier is usually a Scotsman, and if not Scotch, he sits for a Scotch constituency, and the Lord Chancellor, the keeper of the King's conscience, is a Scotsman too. London has become an annex of Edinburgh, and Canada is little more than a Scotch off-hand farm. Our single satisfaction is that whenever we want a book to read, we have only to apply to Skeeble Castle, and Mr. Carnegie will send a free library by return. It is a pleasant way he has of reminding us that we want educating. Next to being born a Scotsman, Lord Lorburn was most fortunate in his name. Many a man's career is blasted by an ill name. When Mr. A. C. Morton rose upon the firmament of Parliament, he seemed to have a prosperous future before him. But one day a malevolent pressman in the gallery discovered that A. C. stood for Alpheus Cleophus. He published the fact to the world, and Mr. Morton never recovered from the blow. He vanished in derisive laughter. His fate was sealed at the font. No man can stagger to success under such a burden as Alpheus Cleophus, and half the bitterness felt toward Mr. Jabez Balfour was due to his unctuous name. It was an aggravation of his offense. It was felt to embody all the negative pieties. Lord Lorburn, on the other hand, might claim that his name was his fortune. There was a simplicity and a directness of appeal about Bob Reed that was irresistible. It left nothing more to be said. It was like a certificate of good character. It made you trust him without knowing him. It seemed to bubble over with good humor, to radiate honesty and simple worth, to utter volumes of sound sense. 
A man who was known to everybody as Bob had disarmed the world. He simply had to enter in and take possession. A plain, unvarnished man, large of frame and soft of voice, stiff in opinion, honest and unimaginative, loyal in friendship, immovably obstinate in purpose, he represents the British type in its stubborn devotion to justice as perfectly as his predecessor represented it in its ruthless claim to the supremacy of force. There was more geniality about Lord Halsbury than about Lord Lorburn, but it was the geniality of a merry ogre, secure of his victims, jubilant in his strength, jovially contemptuous of moral considerations. Under the Stuarts, he would have whipped Dr. Clifford off to Jack Catch with a quip about shaving his beard for him. Nothing is more significant of the change effected by the election of 1906 than the fact that Lord Lorburn sits where Lord Halsbury sat for nearly twenty years. Lord Halsbury, for whose genius as a lawyer, by the way, Lord Lorburn has a profound admiration, filled his great office with a jolly cynicism that made his tenure of the woolsack notorious. He frankly regarded it as a political instrument. He reduced the bench to a lower level than it had touched for a century. Any party hack, any necessitous relative of a Tory magnate might look for office from the Lord Chancellor. There is a story, probably invented, but conveying the spirit of political preference with which he exercised his great powers of patronage, that when one position on the bench fell vacant, the late Lord Salisbury asked him to appoint a certain barrister to the post. Even Lord Halsbury was staggered at the proposal but he said a judge must know a little law it would be a scandal to put blank on the bench it would be a worse scandal replied salisbury for a member of an old county family to pass through the bankruptcy court the plea was irresistible lord chancellor westbury when his nepotism had become so gross a scandal as to lead to protest from his colleagues replied but remember my oath i have promised to appoint only those whom I know to be fitted for the duties. A dozen names are submitted to me. One of them is that of a man whom I have known for years, perhaps all my life, and whom I know to be fitted for the office. What am I to do? It was an unanswerable way of putting the case, but Lord Halsbury had a certain blunt honesty that would have scorned such ingenious defences. To the victors, the spoils, was his maxim, and he acted upon it with a gay contempt for criticism which had a certain merit that adroit excuses would not have had. The fault of Lord Lorburn is in the opposite direction. He is overwhelmed with the sense of responsibility. The solemn oath he has taken is ever present to his mind. I saw him take it, said a friend of his to me, and I saw the deep impression it made later. I went to see him when he was considering an appointment. When he began to murmur his oath, without fear or favor, and the rest, I knew there was going to be trouble. Soon after the election I was sitting at dinner next to one of those clever women of the Tory party who pulled the strings of government behind the scenes. I was terribly frightened of your Lord Chancellor, she said. I have just met him at dinner. We have nothing to fear from your Lord Chancellor. What she meant was that Lord Lorburn was so just that he could be relied on to be a little unjust to his own side. Hence the anger, not loud but deep, that has raged around him. His speeches in the House of Lords are brave utterances of uncompromising radicalism. The man who stood like a rock against the war now faces the serried ranks of Toryism, and in suave accents delivers the most radical speeches ever spoken from the woolsack since the days of Brougham. But when it comes to the administration of his department, then away with party. Justice, as he conceives it, shall be done, though the heavens of liberalism fall in ruins. It was he, he, the fierce enemy of the war and of Chinese serfdom, who stood for the sanctity of those 16,000 permits which the Tories issued to the mine owners on the eve of the dissolution. It is he who has restored the full authority of Tory Lord Lieutenants throughout the country to ratify the nominations to the magistracy every appointment shall be made on its intrinsic merits and through traditional channels without relation to politics 
an excellent ideal except that the lord lieutenants have no legal authority as lord herschel showed an excellent ideal if we did not start with a bench packed during twenty years with conservatives but to the plain man who fought to destroy this gross partiality of the bench and who incidentally placed lord lorburn in the position to do him justice this excessive correctitude seemed like a betrayal lord lorburn has faced the rebels in his own camp as unflinchingly as he faces the lords on questions of policy and principle or as he used to face the bowling in the days when he kept wicket for oxford he faces them with a certain stiffness and hauteur that treats criticism as an affront to his solemn oath i do not wish to be introduced to mr blank he said on one occasion of a certain liberal m p i do not wish to be introduced to those associated with him he has been very rude to me on the subject of the magistrates whether we like this view of duty or not we cannot but respect its honesty and fearlessness it springs from a rare purity of motive from the ideal of public service as a sacred trust such a tradition will make the task of future halsbury's difficult in his personal relations lord lorburn has none of the cold severity of office he is a man of singular sensitiveness and tenderness of heart clinging to old memories and old friendships his devotion to the late sir frank lockwood when living and to his memory now that he is dead is typical of this fine trait they were the david and jonathan of the bar and the house sir frank as those who saw the exhibition of his caricatures will remember satirized his friend mercilessly pictured him in kilts holding on to a lamp-post meeting a young lady in the dusk with the legend meet me at the corner when the clock strikes nine and preparing his speech for the parnell commission with the aid of a short black pipe and a huge whisky bottle but no one enjoyed these wild extravagances of friendship more than sir robert his affection for kindly john o'connor m p is a tradition of the house and of the national liberal club and he never fails to preside at the frequent dinners to spencer leigh hughes show me a man's friends in these friendships we have the key to lord lorburn's character he loves the plain unpretentious man who wants nothing fears nothing hates cant and tells the truth all the better if he plays cricket does he bowl used to be one of his questions when a candidate for the eighty club came before him for in the days of his youth he was a brilliant wicket-keeper filling the position for oxford against cambridge and in the days of his years and dignities he became president of the m c c thrice moreover he represented oxford at rackets and later fought for the amateur tennis championship unsuccessfully against sir edward grey but he was far too good a scot to allow pleasure to absorb his energies and his industry and solid capacity secured him a double first and when he saw that the attractions of the playing fields endangered his career he put bat and racket firmly aside for ever the same resolute purpose and tenacity carried him to the head of his profession when jowett asked him what career he proposed for himself and he told him the bar the master of balliol said in his arid way you will do no good at the bar good morning when years later his reputation made and his future secure he revisited oxford jowett said by the way mr reed i told you you would be no good at the bar i beg your pardon good morning it is dogged that does it and the lord chancellor's career is the most striking example to-day of what may be achieved by plain homespun capacities governed by an indomitable purpose his love of the plain man was the secret of his devotion to sir henry campbell bannerman as it was of sir henry's attachment to him an attachment not blind to his little defects reed is a splendid fellow and a very good radical he said to me but if he doesn't have his own way he can be an uncomfortable bedfellow through all the bitter time of the war sir robert stood by him with a loyalty that neither asked nor gave quarter he was the relentless enemy of the liberal league stiff uncompromising and challenging he burnt his boats with the rosebury party and in the temple his chances of the chancellorship were ridiculed 
but when lord rosebery went down to bodmin one saturday and said finally i will not serve under that flag he incidentally placed sir robert reed on the woolsack his was the first appointment sir henry campbell bannerman made when he came into power with the exception i have indicated it has been splendidly justified lord lorburn has not the learning of gladstone's great chancellors page wood and rondel palmer but he has courage high purpose and persuasiveness his appointments to the high court and the county court have won general approval he has set himself to reform the law's delay with striking success on the bench his judgments are grave lucid and weighty he is an example of the maxim that honesty is the best policy honesty backed by very plain everyday qualities industry courage unwavering purpose a solid man without brilliancy imagination profundity or humour he has risen to the highest place in a profession in which these qualities are more common than in any other department of life it is the triumph of character the reward of the industrious apprentice and of sterling worth england has had more brilliant lord chancellors but none who combined in a greater degree the sense of the high responsibilities of his office with perfect honesty unaffected dignity and rare lucidity of thought and utterance end of chapter twenty three Chapter twenty four of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty four Thomas Hardy. A friend of mine, one of those people described by Keats as being married to a romance and given away by a sonnet, stopped in the course of a pilgrimage in Wessex at the hotel of a small market town as he waited for lunch he discussed men and things with a farmer a cheerful bucolic soul whose name may have been gabriel oak does thomas hardy ever come here he asked thomas hardy thomas hardy and the farmer's face took on the pale cast of thought suddenly his countenance cleared ah he said with an air of quiet triumph born of superior knowledge you mean bill hardy the pig dealer a little round-faced man with whiskers under his chin oh yeah he comes here every market day my friend expressed his satisfaction at the information and sat down to his lunch with the comfortable sense of a secret possession farmer oak stood before him delightfully unconscious that he was immortal for thomas hardy shares the privilege of the prophets of old he loves quiet and obscurity and he has realized that to be obscure you must dwell among your own people he knows too that to keep the inspiration pure you must drink at the spring whence it issues and not slake your thirst at the muddy waters of london and so when after years of london life hovering between architecture and literature he found that he had a career in literature open to him he returned to his own people and there not far from the little cottage at upper bockhampton where he was born where his mother died in her ninetieth year whence fifty years ago he used to trudge to the architect's office at dorchester and whither he used to return to burn the midnight oil over the classics and the greek testament he lives in the deepening shadow of the mystery of this unintelligible world the journey that began with the bucolic joy of under the greenwood tree has reached its close in the unmitigated misery of jude the obscure accompanied by the mocking voices of those aerial spirits who pass their comments upon the futile struggle of the dentists as they march their armies to and fro across the mountains and rivers of that globe which the eye of imagination sees whirling like a midge in space napoleon and the powers what are they but puppets in the hand of some passionless fate loveless and hateless whose purposes are beyond all human vision o oh, eminence that reasonest not in putting forth all things begot thou buildest thy house in space for what o oh, loveless hateless past the sense of kindly-eyed benevolence to what tune dances this immense and for answer comes the mocking voice of the spirit ironic for one i cannot answer but i know tis handsome of our pity so to sing the praises of the dreaming dark dumb thing that turns the handle of this idle show 
night has come down upon the outlook of the writer as it came down over the sombre waste of egdon heath there is not a cheerful feature left not one glint of sunshine in the sad landscape of broken ambitions and squalor and hopeless strivings and triumphant misery labor and sorrow a little laughter disillusion and suffering and after that the dark not the dark that flees before the cheerful dawn but the dark whose greatest benediction is eternal nothingness other men of genius most men of genius have had their periods of deep dejection in which only the mocking voice of the spirit ironic answered their passionate questionings shakespeare himself may be assumed to have passed through the valley of gloom in that tremendous period when he produced the great tragedies but he came out of the shadow and the winter's tale has the serenity and peace of a cloudless sunset but the pilgrimage of thomas hardy has led us ever into deeper shadow the shades of the prison-house have closed around us and there is no return to the cheerful day the journey we began with those jolly carol-singers under the greenwood tree has ended in the hopeless misery of jude and yet what a journey it has been what companions we have had by the way tranter dewey taking off his coat to the dance farmer oak in the midst of his sheepfold looking up to the stars for the hour of night giles winterbourne and marty south planting the young larches amid the deep silence of the woodlands michael hinchard magnificent in his rude elemental strength most impressive in the hour of his utter discomfiture and desolation above all the companionship of nature which is the true secret of his abiding hold nature is never a mere picturesque background for the human play it is the most potent personality light said the impressionist is the chief person in a picture nature is the chief actor in the hardy drama nature vast sentient mysterious upon whose bosom the brief human figure is tossed like driftwood in its passage from eternity to eternity one feels here as in wordsworth's poetry to which the poetic prose of hardy is the complement that the mighty being is awake and doth with her eternal motion make a sound like thunder everlastingly out of that immensity and mystery of nature poor humanity emerges to play its part and that a sad one for even the gleams of joy and what humour is more rich more reminiscent of the shakespearean vintage than that of the wessex rustics are shadowed with the sense of doom that makes our triumphs trivial and happiness itself a jest justice was done and the president of the immortals an Escalian phrase had finished his sport with tess in that sentence we have an epitome of thomas hardy's conception of human life a creature in the hand of an impenetrable fate cold passionless indiscriminating whose justice is a mockery to whom virtue is nothing and vice nothing and from whose grim ironic grasp we escape to utter darkness and silence i have said that hardy's concept of nature is complementary to wordsworth's it is the shadow of the deep valley cast by the mountain on whose sunward slopes the light still sleeps the spirit of night broods over all majestic mysterious ominous night and the twilight jupiter casting the shadow of tess as she digs in the allotment the pageant of the stars passing before the rapt gaze of st cleve the breath of the night wind awaking the thin music of the heath or stirring the woodlands to a richer symphony the primeval monoliths terrific awesome instinct with meaning and mystery in the vast and suggestive twilight this is the atmosphere in which the figures move on to a destiny as inscrutable as night in all this and the philosophy it connotes he is the antithesis of meredith whose voice is of the morning and whose vision is of the day meredith is the mind looking out with quick and thrilling interest upon the play of life hardy is the heart wrung by its agonies an infant crying for the light to meredith nature is a joyous companion filled with the spirit of immortal youth it is the lark uprising of whom he sings to hardy it is a merciless fate uttering itself in the hoot of the night owl 
he is the malay of literature sounding the same note of the sorrow of the earth working in the same elemental media it is not his semi-barbaric women that we remember they are excrescences it is his peasants untouched by the centuries types of the enduring elements of humanity as egdon heath is the type of the earth's ageless story whom we love gabriel oak the glass of truth and the mould of manhood giles winterbourne tender and self-effacing a hero in corduroys marty south nursing her love in secret and when death has given to her the object of her devotion crooning by his grave her triumphant grief now my own own love you are mine and only mine for she has forgot ye at last although for her you died but i whenever i get up i'll think o ye and whenever i lie down i'll think o ye whenever i plant the young larches i'll think that none can plant as you planted and whenever i split a gad and whenever i turn the cider ring i'll say none could do it like you if ever i forget your name let me forget home and heaven but no no my love i can never forget ye for you was a good man and did good things it is this intense insight into the beauty of simplicity and the heart of the humble this passion for the native and the sincere combined with the immensity of the stage on which the drama moves that differentiates the wessex tales from all other literature and suggests the elemental boldness of norse legends norse legends touched with the shadow of modern thought and the spirit of doom that pervades the greek drama but if he is the malay of literature he is malay without the angelus his peasants are bowed to the brown earth in the mystic light but no far-off bell tolls a message through the quiet air and without that message the parallel breaks down at the crucial point for it was with that throb of the bell in the angelus that malay rang through the heart of the world and still rings the laborious day is over the grey sky still shadows the sombre plain but there is a rift in the west and a word is borne to the tired heart on the pulsing air hope is not gone out of the world but there is little hope beneath the pall that hangs over the wessex stage life is ever lord of death says whittier and with him all those whose eyes turn to the dawn death is ever lord of life says hardy and with him those whose eyes turn to the sun going down in pitiless gloom it is the eternal conflict between the optimist and the pessimist between yea and nay between the upward look and the downward but the world is with those who like browning's grammarian are for the morning not with those who are of the dark and hear only the voices of the night in the unity of his achievement mr hardy stands alone in the history of english fiction this is due as mr lascelles abercrombie has shown to the deliberate subordination of his art to his metaphysic it is not necessary to accept his philosophy in order to appreciate its impressive and cohesive influence upon his work it gives it continuity design a cumulative grandeur that makes it unique in our literature his vision of men charged with aspirations and desires caught in the relentless toils of the purposive unmotive dominant thing which sways in brooding dark their wayfaring may be a vision of the dark and not of the day it may be the vision of a recluse brooding in solitude over his own conception of reality and shadowing all his perceptions of the activities of life with his painful obsession but out of this correspondence of conception and perception springs the unity of hardy's work the note is struck at the beginning even in that sweetest of english comedies under the greenwood tree which closes with the hint of tragic secrecy it deepens through the main structure of his creation until the implicit agony of the conflict between man and the unweeting will utters itself in the explicit rebellion of jude and it rises to its complete summation in the dentists the material of the hardy drama is at once simple and stupendous human and cosmic a few peasants types of the general sin of personal existence and personal desire in a universe of indifferent fate the protagonists are nature and man 
the theme the conflict between the unconquerable soul and that blind will that heaves through space and moulds the times with mortals for its fingers in such a struggle man emerges splendid and abject splendid in his defiant resistance to circumstance abject in the futility of his challenge to the all-urging will raptly magnipotent tess paying the debt she does not owe henchard stealing away to die in solitude the figures of the napoleonic drama fighting and intriguing while the spirits of the air chant their pitying or ironic comments all typify the eternal struggle of the free will caught in the trap of blind circumstance the machinery of the drama has the elemental quality that befits the theme it moves with the rhythm of inexorable fate it is rich in climax yet no matter how unexpected the climax is always attained with the simple inevitableness of a natural law the law that breaks the poor human figure on the wheel of doom mr hardy would deny that a philosophy such as his based upon an honest acceptance of facts as he observes them has any serious relation to the capacity for personal joy happiness and gloom he will tell you are the products not of philosophy but of individual temperament which is unaffected by any theory of the governance or destiny of men the turkish lady quoted by boswell put the view in another way when she said ma foi monsieur notre bonheur dépend de la façon que notre sang circule mr hardy has said truly that the human soul has normally less specific gravity than the sea of misery into which it is cast and emerges inevitably to the surface so far as philosophy has any influence upon happiness he believes that he is more truly happy who refuses the refuge of revelation he cannot prove and cultivates a reasonable serenity and fortitude on the basis of the perceived facts of life for what he calls the professional optimist he has unaffected scorn he reminds him of the smile on the face of a skull if you have the good fortune to meet thomas hardy you will certainly find him more cheerful than his philosophy an alert and knickerbockered man pleasant and companionable trotting through the streets of dorchester talking to its people glad to show you the scenes his genius has made so memorable and having done jumping lightly on his bicycle in spite of the sixty-seven years and riding away leaving you a little puzzled that the wizard should be so like the plain man but it is not the wizard you have met him you will meet on the spacious heath under the night sky by the gaunt ruin of corfu castle wandering among the shadows that haunt the lonely barrow or on the cliffs hard by lulworth cove a presence subtle and pervasive watching you with a thousand eyes accompanying you with noiseless tread for he has performed this miracle he has printed himself so indelibly upon this wessex country has penetrated so deeply to its heart that it seems to speak in his own accents it is a world whose realities have become charged with the magic of his dreams End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of prophets priests and kings by alfred george gardiner this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five henry chaplin i love to sit in the gallery on a sleepy afternoon and watch mr henry chaplin looking after the affairs of the empire near him on the front opposition bench mr balfour reclines with an air of graceful indolence and beyond mr walter long gently dozes his arms folded his head sunk back upon the cushion his ruddy october face giving a touch of warmth and colour to the scene perhaps mr austin chamberlain sits up alert and watchful but for the real picture of britain guarding her own you must turn to mr chaplin there is no laxity here the afternoon may be drowsy and the cushioned seats seductive but the stern sentinel of empire knows no rest if the son of britain is to go down it shall not be because he slept let the enemy look to it they shall find him wear and waken as they found him long ago his eye is upon them in stern reproof of their knaveries 
he seizes some paper and makes notes not unconscious that the enemy are trembling visibly at the menace that overshadows them he takes off his hat under the stress of emotion and you are surprised at the youthful hue of the chestnut hair he returns it resolutely and firmly to his brows a new point has struck him more notes more craven fear opposite he rises and then what jovian thunders echo round the house in sonorous reverberation with what pomp the portly platitude stalks forth to combat see the noble sweep of the right arm the graceful handling of the cambric handkerchief the fine fervour of the monocle hear the deep chest notes sink into unimaginable depths under the burden of britain's woes and radical iniquities you feel that he would weep but for the spartan spirit that sustains him for the splendid thing about mr chaplin is that he takes himself seriously there as corporal nim would say is the humour of it there is the respect that fills the house with joy at his rising and makes his florid flourishes so gay an interlude it is not vanity in any mean or unworthy sense it is the calm ineradicable conviction of the governing class the ancien regime he is a statesman not by virtue of so dangerous and democratic a thing as intellect but by divine right by right of blood and race brains may be necessary in business but what you want in statesmanship sir is blood it is blood that tells sir what is wrong with the house of commons to-day is that there is not enough blood in it shopkeepers lawyers coal miners journalists sitting here in the seats of the mighty some of them even on the front bench opposite oh sir the pity of it oh my poor misguided fallen country but sir and the portly frame distends with magnanimity i will never desert her i will never leave the burning deck it is this portentous gravity and detachment from reality that make him if not witty himself the cause of wit in other men he is not merely a thing of beauty but a joy for ever what moment for example ever rivalled the hilarity that shook the house when speaking on the old age pension bill he declaimed his left hand upon his heart his right uplifted to the heavenly witness it has ever been the purpose of my life to do nothing that would sap the foundations of thrift among the poor he paused puzzled by the hurricane of laughter for his mind moves with bucolic leisure and it did not occur to him that his noble sentiment had any application to himself he a gentleman of blood and birth whose career was a legend of splendid lavishness and who in his old age honoured the state by receiving from it a trifling pension of twelve hundred pounds a year a mere bagatelle a thank-offering as it were from a grateful public almost indeed in the nature of conscience money the incident revealed the true workings of a type of mind so remote from the thought of our day as to be well-nigh incredible it is a type of mind that belongs to the eighteenth century it sees society in two clearly defined strata a small select aristocracy born booted and spurred to ride a large dim mass born saddled and bridled to be ridden it is a divine arrangement does not even the catechism support this theory of human society by bidding you to order yourself lowly and reverently toward your betters he loves the poor in a fine old english way that is he loves them from the point of view of a kindly providence they are poor by the grace of god as he is an aristocrat by the same divine authority i think he would probably spend his pension in scattering benefactions among his retainers but it would never occur to him that they belonged to the same hemisphere as himself that the moral code which was for them was for him also thrift for example is a noble thing in the labourer earning fifteen shillings a week but thrift in a gentleman of blood sir 
god forbid for his view of the aristocracy is the view of the french lady in the days before the revolution who speaking of the vices of a certain nobleman and his prospective career in another world said with reverent abasement but the almighty will think twice before damning a gentleman of his quality if mr chaplin ever reads carlyle how his heart must be stirred by that moving passage probably the only one in all that turgid torrent that would be quite clear to his simple faith it is a faith which regards the established order of things as sacred and eternal it is therefore it ought to be it is the view summed up by thwackham in tom jones when i mention religion said thwackham i mean the christian religion and not only the christian religion but the protestant religion and not only the protestant religion but the church of england it is this view of the divinity that doth hedge his class that is the motive of his politics he honestly believes that the greatness of england consists in the prosperity of a noble landed caste hence his one serious contribution to legislation the agricultural rates bill by which ingenious device the task of paying the agricultural rates fell upon the towns with excellent results to the landlord's rent hence too his devotion to protection to which ah, but this is a subject which should be approached with more solemnity for it is here that mr chaplin must cease to be regarded as a politician rather he is a prophet through long long years he was as one crying in the wilderness the giddy world passed him by heeded not his message laughed him and mr jimmy lowther to scorn give us a good thumping duty on corn was their cry and all will be well then shall the clouds drop fatness and england our brave little england be merry england once more fleeting hopes passed before their vision reciprocity and fair trade came like the cup of tantalus to the lip and vanished and all again was dark and the voice went on crying in the wilderness but a day came when he who had been most scornful in his laughter at these antique jesters suddenly saw a great light suddenly saw that the way to make the people rich and happy was not to give them abundance but scarcity not to make things cheap but dear and filled with this amazing marvel he launched my policy and changed the current of history but it was the squire of blankney who was the prophet of the new dispensation it is the squire of blankney who after years of derision and mocking laughter sits to-day under his vine and fig tree contemplating the work of his hand thinking over the solitary days when he was a voice crying in the wilderness looking forward confidently to the time when a thumping duty on corn will make us all happy and hungry and rejoicing in the rare privilege of the prophet who has lived to see the acceptance of his prophecy it is a rare revenge for the blow that was dealt him in nineteen hundred when having served his queen and country as he would say in that noble rhetoric of his with prudence and he would hope with success he was o oh, miserable ungrateful world abandoned yes abandoned he henry chaplin left out of her majesty's ministry out in the cold like a dog oh the bitterness of that day not that he was sorry for himself not at all but he mourned for his country his betrayed and desolated country for the sad truth has to be told that the prophet was never appreciated by his friends at his real worth i am afraid that they did not take up protection earlier not because they were not protectionists at heart but because they feared that anything which mr chaplin advocated must be disastrous they loved him as their licensed jester they were grateful to him for his honest service for the way he would plant his burly form in the breach when the enemy were nigh as on that famous day of the royal hunt cup when the conservative government were in danger of defeat by a snap division and he like horatius of old rushed in to hold the bridge and save the town and talked and talked and talked while messengers hurried forth west and east and south and north to summon the array and never ceased until the fear that was written on the face of the whips was turned to the gladness of conscious victory 
but while they appreciated these heroisms they did not take him seriously and yet no man ever worked harder at his task according to his capacity than he has done a friend of his tells how he was once staying with him at a country house and in the midst of conversation mr chaplin excused himself on the ground of work and later the friend while wandering in the pastures heard from the other side of the hedge a sonorous voice delivering itself thus mr speaker sir little did i think when i came down to the house this afternoon that i should feel it incumbent upon me in pursuance of my duty to my country and mr speaker may i add to myself to address this house upon and the friend fled from the august recital mr chaplin however bore the whips and scorns of colleagues with the gallant spirit with which he took his losses on the turf for the decline of his fortunes is understood to be not wholly due to the lack of the thumping duty on corn but to that sport of gentlemen to which his really serious life has been devoted not that he has been without his triumphs for is he not the henry chaplin the owner of hermit and who that knows the turf finds not in that name the music of the spheres who knows not the brave story that epic of the race-course of how the unknown horse flashed on that june day significantly heralded by a snowstorm to victory in the derby of eighteen sixty seven winning for its owner one hundred and forty thousand pounds and a deathless fame easy come easy go and mr chaplin's fortune went easily for he is a man of delicate tastes a lucullus of the restaurant who is reputed to know as much about the gastronomic art as he does about horse-flesh and more if that be possible than he does about politics with whom a noble hospitality is innate and in whom as in charles surface that hobbling beldame economy cannot keep pace with generosity he has the gift of spending and leaves the duty of saving to the poor it is not that he is prodigal but that he has that princely point of view illustrated by the duke of whom sir william harcourt used to tell who having got into difficulties applied for advice to mr greville a friend of sir william's mr greville investigated the affairs of the duke and he came to him and said duke i think your establishment is larger than it ought to be and the duke said really charles do you think so and mr greville said yes i find for instance you have got three confectioners in your kitchen i think that is more than is indispensable and the duke looked at him in great surprise and he said you don't mean to say so why after all a man must have a biscuit that is mr chaplin's view he must have a biscuit when sleaford forgetful of its long allegiance forgetful of the lustre shed upon it by mr chaplin left him in the debacle of nineteen o six at the bottom of the pole he with his long experience of the vicissitudes of fortune took his coup de grace with his habitual good temper and gave to wimbledon the distinction of being represented in parliament by the owner of hermit it is an honour well fitted to wimbledon age cannot wither him nor custom stale he lingers on into these drab prosaic times a glorious reminiscence of the days of the dandies defying the machinations alike of time and of the radicals cheerful and debonair his ample hat sitting on his head with just a suspicion of a sporting angle his cambric peeping from his breast pocket with a subtle suggestion of gallantry his eyeglass worn as if to the manner born a kindly simple-hearted gentleman with the gracious manners of an earlier day slightly exaggerated a mirror in which we may see the england of long ago and the toryism that is dead or if not dead passed into a shape less reputable because less honest long may we see him the last of his type sitting on the front opposition bench taking notes and watching over the empire a pleasant figure of industrious futility we could better spare a greater man End of chapter twenty five
Chapter Twenty Six of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Six. Lord Curzon. Lord Curzon would have been a great man if he could occasionally have forgotten Lord Curzon. Health is always unconscious of itself. It is not until sickness that one is aware of the body. It is not until a nation has lost its freedom that it becomes conscious of itself, and the spirit of nationalism burns like a fever in the blood. And the mind in perfect health is equally self-forgetful. Lord Curzon has never enjoyed that health. He has dwelt in a house of mirrors. Wherever he has turned, he has met the dazzling vision of himself. Oxford was but a setting for one magical figure, Parliament the stage for one inimitable actor, India the background for one radiant form in purple and gold. When poor Sir Naylor Leland opposed him at Southport, he turned and rent him as if he were a dog desecrating the sanctuary. When simple St. John Broderick, forgetful of the Balliol days when he had been honoured by the notice of the Honourable George Nathaniel Curzon, dared to veto his action in India because he feared Lord Kitchener even more than he feared Lord Curzon, he forbade him his presence. Where he went, Mr. Broderick must not be. He would not have him in the same social hemisphere. He must get a hemisphere of his own god may forgive him he is reported to have said but i never will it is one of mr chesterton's jolly maxims that a man should be able to laugh at himself poke fun at himself enjoy his own absurdity it is an excellent test of mental health man is a tragic comedian he should see himself the quaint forked radish that he is fantastic as well as wonderful he should see his mind ready to do battle and die if need be for an idea but equally ready to get into a passion because his egg is boiled too hard he should in a word see himself not as a hero but as a man of strange virtues and stranger follies a figure to move him to alternate admiration and laughter lord curzon has never laughed at himself he has only admired and from this immense seriousness, this absence of the faculty of wholesome self-ridicule and self-criticism, issue those mistakes with which his career is strewn, a type of which was his appeal to the sympathy of the world for having asked for and been refused a seat in the House of Lords. It seemed to him an insult to majesty. It seemed to the world a joke it kept the satire of his oxford days true to the mature man it made credible all those strange stories of the pomp and circumstance of the durbar of the viceroy who would not touch swords with the chiefs but left that menial function to the duke of connaught and who turned the wild extravagance of that colossal show into a triumph in which he filled the role of imperial caesar this grandiose vision of himself as caesar was at the root of most of his mistakes in india it was responsible for example for that adventure into tibet an adventure without motive and without consequence except the motive of personal reclame and the consequence of shooting down a defenceless people like a flock of sheep and burdening the indian peasant with his income of two pounds a year with new taxation a high price to pay for the glory of being the first viceroy to penetrate to lhasa it was responsible for that costly folly of the durbar the people were dying of famine and of plague and he gave them a circus for which they had to pay out of their misery it was responsible too for that stupendous white elephant the victoria memorial which is sinking into the mud of the maiden at calcutta the people asked for a memorial that would regenerate their industry a great scheme of technical and scientific education mr j n tata the wealthy parsee offered to start such a scheme with a quarter of a million of money it was refused and the people were offered an idle showpiece in lord curzon's grandiloquent phrase a snow-white fabric arising from the green expanse of the calcutta maidan the taj of the twentieth century he might have given india an instructed people he promised a pretty toy 
it was this view of the mild hindu as a child to be amused and paternally governed that was the vice of his method he was aloof on olympus india had no access to him hindus like mr gokal one of the ablest men and noblest characters with whom i have ever come in contact and mr surendra nath Benerjee, were ignored they were natives children like the rest had he listened to them that fatal partition of bengal would never have been carried out or would have been carried out differently it was carried out ruthlessly and no more momentous act was ever accomplished it has set india alight with a flame that will never die down when i went out to india in nineteen o two said a well-known englishman to me there was no national movement to-day all the land ferments with new national ideals we owe that to lord curzon's provocative policy he has created the new india it is good that there should be a new india it is not good that it should come to birth with the bitter feeling of british injustice the exaggerated sense of one's own place in the scheme of things involves depreciation of the place of others lord curzon always underrated the indian intelligence and always forgot that the indian was a man with the sensibilities of a man if you prick him will he not bleed if you tickle him will he not laugh he often laughed at his lordship sometimes good-naturedly as when at the time of the durbar lord curzon organized a show with the admirable idea of promoting native industries he denounced those who got their furniture and their artistic ideals from tottenham court road the retort was crushing it was pointed out that his residence at the durbar had been furnished by maples whose business is actually in tottenham court road sometimes the laughter had a ring of anger every one remembers that blazing indiscretion at the convocation of calcutta university when addressing the bengali students and the cream of intellectual india he spoke of truth as a western virtue and more than hinted that the orientals like the cretans were liars and that they were given to flattery and other anus sins a shudder went through society how would india take this insult the situation was saved by a hindu with a characteristically tenacious memory he went home took down a problems of the far east by george n curzon and a day or two later there appeared in the amritsa bazaar patrika side by side with the offending passages in the speech the following extract from lord curzon's book before proceeding to the royal audience i enjoyed an interview with the president of the korean foreign office having been particularly warned not to admit to him that i was only thirty-three years old an age to which no respect attaches in korea when he put to me the straight question always the first in the oriental dialogue how old are you i unhesitatingly responded forty dear me he said you look very young for that how do you account for it by the fact i replied that i have been travelling for a month in the superb climate of his majesty's dominions finally he said to me i presume you are a near relative of her majesty the queen of england no i replied i am not but observing the look of disgust that passed over his countenance i was fain to add i am however as yet an unmarried man with which unscrupulous suggestion i completely regained the old gentleman's favour india was dissolved in laughter it almost forgave the insult for the sake of the jest coupled with his exalted view of himself lord curzon has an energy industry and capacity that are probably unrivalled they showed themselves at oxford where he missed his first in greats the indignity cut him to the quick it must be wiped out by heroic means he must win the lothian prize he went away to egypt with his books of reference he worked incessantly came back to london spent a fortnight at the british museum putting the finishing touches on his work and at midnight on the last day for receiving the essays dashed up in a cab to the schools awoke the porter handed in his essay and won the prize 
with a similar fury of industry he later won the arnold prize this power of work he has always shown in india he was the wonder of the service his hand was everywhere nothing was delegated no subject was too microscopic to escape him he instructed the government proofreaders in the correct use of the comma and called the bengal government to book for three errors in the inscription placed on macaulay's calcutta house i remember one incident of this abnormal industry and personal sensitiveness an article criticizing him had appeared in a london paper it came back to the editor neatly pasted on foolscap sheets of paper in the margin he had written for private information an elaborate and detailed reply to every sentence he was not loved by the officials that is not necessarily to his discredit no viceroy who did his duty to india would be loved by the officials he had gone out with the gospel of efficiency and he was imperious in his reforms and in the insistence on his supremacy the famous note on departmentalism is still a classic in indian official circles it is read at nights over the pipe and the glass and such passages as departmentalism is not a moral delinquency it is an intellectual hiatus still makes the rafters ring there was never a viceroyalty so full of the drama of action every day had its new sensation in every scene the limelight was upon him and india to-day for good and evil is largely what he made it many of his reforms were excellent many of his practical schemes admirable he held commissions and inquiries and what is more acted on them his irrigation scheme was a great and worthy effort to combat famine he made a brave stand for the right of the indian to equal justice his action in regard to the ninth lancers was high and courageous the evidence pointed to one of them having been guilty of the murder of a native cook a common enough occurrence they refused to disclose the murderer he degraded the regiment when it marched past at the durbar all official india applauded loudly it was meant as a rebuke to lord curzon sitting there silent upon his horse i hope he saw that it was not a rebuke but the proudest compliment of his career nor do i think he was wrong in the final rupture with lord kitchener at any rate he stood for a great principle the civil control of the army no estimate of lord curzon would be complete which omitted the fact that he has fought his battle with the handicap of physical weakness he has lived his life as it were on broken wing to that we may trace the defects of temperament and outlook nor can one forget the tragedy of his domestic life the loss of the brilliant partner of his career in circumstances full of pathos a brilliant man full of energy full of ambition full of capacity still young though more than forty burning to be in the heart of the fight he finds himself with no path open no role to play his career closed ere it was well begun the brilliant indian episode left him stranded on the political shore for a time he cast longing eyes upon the house where he had once been the best graced actor and where his eager temperament could alone find scope for play then he turned sadly to the house of lords and the shades of that decorous prison house closed on his imperious spirit End of chapter 26chapter twenty seven of prophets priests and kings by alfred george gardiner this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty seven winston churchill it was a quarter to twelve midnight mr balfour was once more at bay defending his tottering ministry from collapse the immediate point was a certain closure resolution what were the terms it was vital to the opposition that they should know and know to-night mr balfour fenced and fainted he would not give the condition he would hand them to the clerk on the adjournment once in his hands they were unpublished and undiscussable until to-morrow the moment of adjournment had almost come and mr balfour had gained his point he threw down the document on the table and the opposition sank back defeated 
in the moment of discomfiture a figure moved towards the table the figure of a youth fair slight with head thrust forward eyes protuberant eyebrows lacking the whole air that of boyish audacity he seized the document turned back to his seat and before the house had quite realized what had happened was disclosing on the usual nightly motion that this house do now adjourn the whole scheme in the form of a rain of questions addressed to mr balfour the secret was out the speaker rose the house adjourned and the members poured out into the lobbies excitedly discussing winston's audacity and what it had disclosed it was the churchill touch it carried the mind back to those brief years when another churchill was the storm centre of the house bearding the mighty gladstone with calculated insolence ridiculing the marshall and snellgroves of his own party and leaping on to his seat in the hour of victory waving his hat and shouting with schoolboy glee what a meteor it was how brilliant its path how dramatic its climax how tragic its eclipse and now his son leaps forward into the arena with the same daring the same aplomb the same incomparable insolence again the cry is a churchill a churchill and to that cry the street responds as to no other for it is the call to high adventure and careless gallantry it suggests the clatter of hoofs in the moonlight the clash of swords on the turnpike road it is the breath of romance stirring the prosaic air of politics when nature has fashioned a genius says emerson she breaks the mould it is true of genius in spite of the possible exception of the pits it is not true of talent a caesar does not follow a caesar nor a shakespeare a shakespeare nor a cromwell a cromwell but to-day we have remarkable evidence of the transmission of high talent mr harcourt mr churchill and lord hugh cecil are not inferior to the fathers that begat them mr churchill indeed is superior to his father for to lord randolph's flair and courage and instinct for the game he adds a knowledge and industry his father did not possess he works with the same fury that he plays attacks a subject with the intrepidity with which he attacks an opponent in the house what are all those books on socialism asked a friend of mine who was calling on mr churchill just before his departure on a tour to east africa they are going to be my reading on the voyage he replied i'm going to see what the socialist case really is and so with his speeches the mistake you young men make said mr chamberlain to some rising politicians is that you don't take trouble with your speeches that is not mr churchill's way i have been told by one who was in scotland with him when he was campaigning that he never appeared at his hostess's table until tea-time all day he might be heard booming away in his bedroom rehearsing his facts and his flourishes to the accompaniment of resounding knocks on the furniture it is not that he is without readiness no one is more intrepid in debate but he is too wise to rely on that faculty in a set speech he has the genius which consists of taking infinite pains the speech with which he leapt into parliamentary fame was that in which while still the youngest recruit of toryism he shattered mr broderick's army scheme it electrified the house by its grasp of the problems of national defence and its spacious movement in the higher realms of moral purpose i wrote that speech out six times with my own hand he told me the courage which that speech displayed sustained him throughout the transition from toryism to liberalism there is no parallel in our time to the intensity of the feeling which that transition aroused his rising filled the government ranks with visible frenzy a frenzy which culminated one day in the whole party two hundred and fifty strong getting up as one man and marching out of the house as he rose to speak it was the highest tribute ever paid to a parliamentary orator it was as though the enemy fled at his appearance from a literal battlefield and indeed the whole spirit of his politics is military it is impossible to think of him except in the terms of actual warfare the smell of powder is about his path and wherever he appears one seems to hear the crack of musketry and to feel the hot breath of battle 
to his impetuous swiftness he joins the gift of calculating strategy his eye takes in the whole field and his skirmishes are not mere exploits of reckless adventure but are governed by the purpose of the main battle he would not with rupert have pursued the flying wing he had broken he would like cromwell have turned and smashed in the enemy's centre from the rear this union of intrepidity and circumspection is accompanied by an independence of aim and motive that must always keep him a little under suspicion he is a personal force and not a party instrument and he will never be easily controlled except by himself he knows nothing of the loyalties which have governed other contemporary leaders of the party c b was anchored to a simple faith in democracy mr asquith is the authentic vehicle of the collective purpose mr harcourt is governed by tradition even mr lloyd george with all his personal energy and initiative is too sensitive to the popular judgment to run amuck but mr churchill knows no sanction except his own will and when he is seized with an idea he pursues it with an intensity that seems unconscious of opposition i will go to worms though there are as many devils in worms as there are tiles on the roofs of the house said luther and that is mr churchill's frame of mind it follows from this combination of daring and astuteness that his oratory has the qualities of the writer as well as of the rhetorician there is form and substance as well as flame and spirit like the hero of his novel savrola in which at twenty-three he foreshadows his career he burnt the midnight oil over his brilliant impromptus he will tell you that his father not only learned his speeches but studied his gestures and his pauses would fumble in his pockets for a note he did not want mr churchill is not indifferent to the same arts to heighten his effect but with the consciousness of power he is tending to rely less upon mere artificialities of manner and more upon the appeal to the intelligence nor does his oratory need extrinsic aids it is rich and varied in its essential qualities the architecture is broad and massive the colouring is vivid but not gaudy he does not worry a humour to weariness he strikes the note of gravity and authority with a confidence that one can hardly reconcile with the youthful face and his satire can be quite in the leisured eighteenth-century style as when attacking mr balfour's cabinet on the fiscal issue he said they are a class of right honourable gentlemen all good men all honest men who are ready to make great sacrifices for their opinions but they have no opinions they are ready to die for the truth if they only knew what truth was they are weary of office they wish anything would relieve them of its cares but their patriotic duty compels them to remain although they have no opinions to offer holding their opinions undecided and unflinching like george the second at the battle of dettingen sans peur et sans avis he is extraordinarily youthful even for his years he has the curiosity and animation of a child a child in fairyland a child consumed with the thirst for life he must know all taste all devour all he is drunk with the wonder and the fascination of living a talk with him is as exhilarating as a gallop across country so full is it of adventure and of the high spirits and eagerness of youth no matter what the subject soldiering or science religion or literature he plunges into it with the joy of a boy taking a header in the sea and to the insatiable curiosity and the enthusiasm of the child he joins the frankness of the child he has no reserves and no shams he takes you as it were by the arm on the instant and makes you free of all the domain of his mind you are welcome to anything that he has and may pry into any corner you like he has that scorn of concealment that belongs to a caste which never doubts itself and to a personality that is entirely fearless and he is as frank with himself as with you yes he said i have read james's immortality i have read it three times it impressed me deeply but finally i came to the conclusion that i was lacking in the religious sense and put it away he has coupled with this sense of deficiency a real reverence for the spiritual man 
his admiration for lord hugh cecil is sincere and unaffected he speaks of him as one who dwells within the palace of the king while he stands without the gate his school was the barrack room his university the battlefield he has served in two regiments of the line fought with the spaniards in cuba and held a commission in the south african light horse he knows life in four continents and has smelt powder in three he has seen more wars than any man of his years written more books than any soldier living he has been a war correspondent he has been taken prisoner he has escaped from prison and he showed the same address in war as in politics general smuts told me that when he held up the armored train on which mr churchill was captured he was struck by the energy and capacity of a fair-haired youth who led the defense when they surrendered this youth modestly claimed special privileges in telegraphing to his friends on the ground that he was a war correspondent the general laughed you have done all the damage that's been done he said you fight too well to be treated as a civilian and now added the general in telling me the story i am going to the colonial office to see if i can get a favor out of that fair-haired youth in memory of our meeting on the veld when hot from campaigning on indian frontiers and egyptian sands he galloped up to westminster with his breezy stand and deliver he found mr balfour lacking in enthusiasm mr balfour knew his father indeed followed his father in the jolly hounslow heath days of the early eighties but while it was capital fun to go tiger hunting with a churchill it was another affair to have a churchill worrying you in office he remembered his uncle's famous moat when after the memorable resignation he was asked if he did not want lord randolph back lord salisbury replied when you have got rid of a boil on the neck you don't want it back again mr balfour determined that he would not have a boil on his neck his coolness did mr churchill a service it hastened his inevitable development like his father he has the instinct of democratic appeal his intellectual fearlessness carries him resistlessly along the path of constitutional development the fundamental vice of conservatism is that it distrusts the people its fundamental policy is to hoodwink the people bribe them drug them use them as tools lord randolph saw the folly of this he saw that no party could be vital without the sanction of an instructed people and that the modern state was healthy in proportion to the development of a healthy democratic opinion he tried to hitch the democracy to the tory chariot by making toryism a real instrument of reform it was a gallant dream and he was broken on the wheel in the attempt mr churchill is happier in his fate he was fired out of the tory tabernacle before he had eaten out his heart in a vain service his future is the most interesting problem of personal speculation in english politics at thirty-four he stands before the country one of the two most arresting figures in politics his life a crowded drama of action his courage high his vision unclouded his boats burned i love churchill and trust him said one of his colleagues to me he has the passion of democracy more than any man i know but don't forget that the aristocrat is still there latent and submerged but there nevertheless the occasion may arise when the two churchills will come into sharp conflict and i should not like to prophesy the result we may doubt both the democrat and the aristocrat and suspect that his real political philosophy is the philosophy of caesarism if we could conceive him in a great upheaval he would be seen emerging in the role of what bagel calls a benthamite despot dismissing all feudal ideas and legitimist pretensions sweeping aside all aristocracies proclaiming the democratic doctrine of the greatest happiness of the greatest number and seating himself astride the storm as the people caesar at once dictator and democrat but caesarism however picturesque and in certain conditions even unavoidable is never more than a temporary episode a stop-gap expedient in a society shifting to new foundations our foundations are fixed and mr churchill's genius will have to find its scope within existing limits 
there his detachment from the current philosophies his impetus of mind and his personal force make him a not easily calculable factor more than any man of his time he approaches an issue without mental reserves or the restraints of party caution or calculation to his imperious spirit a party is only an instrument au fond he would no more think of consulting a party than the chauffeur would think of consulting his motor-car his magnificent egotism takes refuge in no concealments you see all the processes of his mind it may be said of him as lord russell said of the british constitution that he is like a hive of bees working under a glass cover he leaves you in no doubt he does not hum and ha he is not paralyzed by the fear of consequences nor afraid to contemplate great changes he knows that to deal in millions is as simple as to deal in pence and that timidity is the unpardonable sin in politics has he staying power can one who has devoured life with such feverish haste retain his zest to the end of the feast how will forty find him that fatal forty when the youth of rose-light and romance has faded into the light of common day and the horizon of life has shrunk incalculably and when the flagging spirit no longer answers to the spur of external things but must find its motive and energy from within or find them not at all that is the question that gives us pause for with all his rare qualities mr churchill is the type of the gentleman of fortune he is out for adventure and follows politics as he would follow the hounds he has no animus against the fox but he wants to be in at the kill it is recorded that when a fiery-headed boy at harrow he was asked what profession he thought of taking up he replied the army of course so long as there's any fighting to be had when that's over i shall have a shot at politics he is still the harrow boy having his shot at politics not so much concerned about who the enemy may be or about the merits of the quarrel as about being in the thick of the fight and having a good time with the facility of the churchill mind he feels the pulse of liberalism with astonishing sureness and interprets it with extraordinary ability but the sense of high purpose is not yet apparent through the fierce joy of battle that possesses him the passion for humanity the stern resolve to see justice done though the heavens fall and he be buried in the ruins the surrender of himself to the cause these things have yet to come his eye is less on the fixed stars than on the wayward meteors of the night and when the exhilaration of youth is gone and the gallop of high spirits has run its course it may be that this deficiency of high and abiding purpose will be a heavy handicap then it will be seen how far courage and intellectual address a mind acutely responsive to noble impulses and a quick and apprehensive political instinct will carry him in the leadership of men End of chapter twenty seven